Viking Stadium, unionizing daycares, and working relationships with the legislature. We sit down for an in-depth conversation with Governor Mark Dayton in this week's Capitol Report. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this week's Capitol Report. I'm Julie Bartke. He's been the chief executive of the state since being sworn in on January 3rd, 2011. Mark Dayton is Minnesota's 40th governor. He ran on a platform of increasing income tax on the rich, willingness to work in a bipartisan manner, and job creation. His first session ended in a government shutdown, a special session, and now he faces the challenge of turning Minnesota's economy around and keeping Minnesota's premier sports team, the Vikings, in the state. Joining me on the Capitol Report set, we have Minnesota Governor Mark Dayton. Governor, thank you so much for coming on. Thanks for having me today. I want to begin with a little discussion about jobs. Since session has concluded, you've hosted a job summit, you've gone around the state and spoken with business leaders. The idea is to gain ideas. Now, so what were some of the key, perhaps, aha moments that you encountered? Well, the, the one consistent uh, suggestion was that we, we need to better align our higher education training, particularly the technical colleges, with the, the jobs of the future. And that means uh, reconfiguring some of the pro, uh, courses that the technical colleges teach, giving them some uh, updated equipment and technology so that they can provide the, those uh, you know, career opportunities. And so I think that, that more than anything was something that you know, we, I've talked with the, the new chancellor, uh, the Minskew, and, and you know, said that the next bonding bill, I really want to focus uh, the Minskew's request on, on upgrading this uh, equipment and technology. And so I you know, think we can see some real progress there. The environmental uh, and regulatory permitting, uh, you know, is, uh, continues to be a concern. We uh, have had good results. The uh, MPCA uh, said today that 96% uh, of the new and expanded permits, uh, which are the ones that will lead to additional jobs, are, are being approved now within the 150 days that my executive order and the legislature's uh, uh, actions called for. So, uh, you know, again, I think we're, we're making progress. So there's a lot more progress that needs to be made. And following your economic summit, you did announce pumping $200 million into certificates of deposit at community banks to try to encourage lending. A host of studies have shown that banks have had funds that they could loan out for quite some time, but they aren't lending for a variety of reasons. Do you think your proposal and this additional money will help soften that stance a bit? Well, uh, hopefully. I mean, I, you can't make them lend. But uh, you know, I, community banks are you know, rooted in their communities, and and most of them really want uh, their communities to prosper and the businesses in them to prosper. So if anyone's uh, in a position to you know really want to carry this out, I would say it'd be the community banks. Okay, you mentioned bonding, and we're going to go into that in just a moment. But first, much of the focus of job creation by the GOP thus far has been on streamlining government and and permitting, and also cutting and eventually eliminating the corporate income tax. Now, of course, you've supported streamlining. We just talked about that, but would you support at all reducing this tax? Well, I think they want to. They talk about reducing and eliminating every tax. I mean, their view seems to be if you eliminate taxes and eliminate regulations, then everybody will live happily ever after. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm for cutting taxes, but the question is then, what do you cut in terms of? services that, that people need and depend upon, the businesses need and depend upon. Out in the real world of these uh, nine uh, regional economic development summits and then the state summit, I find uh, business uh, men and women are a lot more real world uh, pragmatic than some of the uh, ideology I hear within the capital. Uh, they recognize there's a role for government. They recognize uh, with, through the bonding and through other forms of public uh, participation with them and support of them that uh, we can go a lot farther. So, you know, I, cut, eliminating the corporate income tax, uh, I think the, the corporate income tax is, is regressive in that small businesses that do most or all of their businesses in, in Minnesota pay a higher uh, effective tax rate than the larger uh, national or international corporations. And I think that should be addressed. But, you know, we, we still need to figure out how we're going to fund education and higher education, which was cut 15 percent in the last session. And the other thing is that the business people t tell us they, they need and depend upon in order to be successful. So you do agree, though, that there could be some reform in that corporate income tax structure? I think, I think definitely there could be. I think, again, the small businesses that are doing most of all their business in Minnesota pay a higher rate than the large ones. And that, to me, is the opposite of 
the way it should be. Okay, Governor, you mentioned bonding a little bit earlier. What size of a bonding bill do you hope to propose or do you plan to propose this year? It is a bonding bill, it is a bonding year, but the GOP, as of thus far, not a big appetite for a large bonding bill. What are your thoughts? Well, I, it, it, it's hard sometimes to think what they do have an appetite for. Uh, you know, it's sort of, it, they're just against, they say for they're for jobs, but they're against the, you know, the stadium, which has created several thousand jobs, and they're against the bonding bill. Uh, we had to kind of force that one down their throats as part of the resolution of the shutdown last summer. Uh, I was up in St. Cloud just uh, two weeks ago at St. Cloud State, uh, groundbreaking for this $42 million uh, science, new science building. It'd be great for the university, great for the students, and they're going to employ 1,200 people on, on uh, the project. So, you know, those are the kind of steps that I'd like to see us you know, continue to take. Now, I had proposed last year a billion dollar bonding bill. We got 530 million of that through. Uh, whether uh, the climate is such that we can propose another number close to that remains uh, still to be seen. Uh, we issued uh, these tobacco bonds, uh, which I think is very unwise, but uh, you know, that's uh, added to the, our overall you know, debt, debt load and the possibility of a stadium uh, bonding. So, you know, I, I can't commit to an amount, but I, 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 we have $2 billion of requests already. And so, you know, and, and most of them are very valid and legitimate needs. So. You know, I, I believe we got to keep making those investments in improving our infrastructure or we suffer the consequences down the road. Would it be your preference to see the Viking Stadium somehow included or a people stadium somehow included in this bonding bill? Well, no, I think it's a separate consideration. I think these would be general obligation bonds and the, the, the uh, stadium as it looks right now would um, hopefully be appropriation bonds, they're called. So it'd be a separate category and that's one of the reasons I think we should deal with the stadium uh, separately and uh, by itself because it's such a huge project and there's very complex uh, factors involved and decisions to be made and I think it's far better if they could focus exclusively on that uh, but that remains to be seen. And let's talk a bit more about the stadium. The GOP of course has uh, been very public saying they want the public to weigh in on the issue. The Senate just announced that it has scheduled two hearings on this issue, one on November 29th, the other on December 6th. What message does that say to you? Senator? Well, I commend uh, Senator Rosen, and she and Representative Lanning have been just terrific to work with. They've been just stalwarts uh, carrying this through with all the resistance uh, they've and uh, non-support that they've encountered um, among their, their colleagues. And uh, having the two Senate hearings is a very important step, and uh, you know, hopefully the House will follow suit, and, and you know, those are uh, very significant developments, and I really appreciate Senator Rosen and uh, Senator Ortman also was chairing one of the hearings for taking that uh, initiative. What does your instinct tell you about this issue at this point? Well, I think for a lot of people, it's a controversial vote that they'd rather wait until after the November 12 election and take it up in 2013. I mean, that was always the argument for doing it this year is it's much more difficult to do one of these projects in an election year. and. Uh, I'm, I hope I'm proven wrong, but I you know, remain skeptical that there's really a bottom line intention to deal with it uh, either the end of this year, or which looks unlikely now, or, or, or even in the next session. And you know, I, I mean, we, we could be putting several thousand people to work. This is about an opportunity to clear off a contaminated site, the largest Superfund site in Minnesota at Arden Hills or a blighted site in Minneapolis and put several thousand people to work for three or four years of building the facility and there'll be uh, ancillary development around it. Uh, you know, there, I wish we could develop both of them. I wish we had the reasons and the means to develop both of them because there'd be even more thousands of people working. And uh, you know, that's again where you know, the public sector's role in economic development and we can do it without a single dollar of general fund tax revenue. So it'll be entirely funded by users of the stadium through uh, you know, ticket taxes and souvenirs and uh, people who want to you know, involve in, in gambling. So you know, there's a way I think we can address the principal objection which people have, which is no, no tax dollars, no general fund tax dollars go into the project, either local or state, and we can still get it accomplished and put people to work. Okay, I want to move on. On Tuesday, you issued an executive order authorizing a vote of child care providers to potentially unionize. You're going to pay people better 
wages or provide health care to people who don't have it now, there, there, there's you know, going to be some cost implication. But you know, that would require, uh, and the order states clearly anything that requires an appropriation or additional appropriation, anything that requires new legislation uh, would have to obviously go to the legislature. And anything that involves uh, changing any of the existing rules would have to go through the formal rulemaking process. So you know, this, this does not empower anybody to act unilaterally. It just gives uh, in the minds of people who are proponents of voice. And again, I'm not, I'm not saying the, taking sides on what the outcome should be. I'm just giving people who are for and people against what I think is the fairest way, the American way to resolve their differences, which is to hold an election and let the majority decide. I challenge uh, his statement that he has done due diligence uh, when he cannot even answer questions asked by you, the media on whether or not the AG has weighed in on the legal aspects of his executive order. I challenge his due diligence uh, when he makes the comment that he doesn't even know how many uh, daycare providers would be eligible to vote under his executive order. And I think the direction that he has, has taken uh, is the wrong direction. We did have a hearing on this matter a couple of weeks ago. Senator Perry and I, we did have testimony. One of the things that we learned in the course of that hearing is that there is nothing in Minnesota law that provides the governor with the power to do the thing that he says he's going to do. And I think the real question for us is, what do you do with a governor who won't follow the law? And we've seen this pattern played out a number of occasions. We've seen it with how he's handled the uh, health care exchange issue at the federal level. We've seen how he's handled this with respect to the uh, federal grants that we just had a hearing about this morning where he is uh, attacking members of the legislature for following the statute in Minnesota law on how these grants are to be provided. I think that we have to ask the question, is the governor's motive to try to find a way to, to govern without the consent of the duly elected legislature? My general counsel and uh, the Attorney General has not taken a definitive position on, on it, but uh, uh, we have no information that it's not within my legal authority, and my belief is that it is within my legal authority. Somebody can have a legitimate difference of opinion about that, and you know, then that's a matter for somebody else to resolve. But uh, we're proceeding with the belief that uh, I do have that authority. Governor, I have a baby in daycare, and when my, my daycare provider learned of this, she asked me essentially why. So I'm passing that question along to you. Why? Well, some child care providers want a, a form of union. They think it'll result in better working conditions, better wages, uh, benefits like health care, which uh, most of them don't have. And there are those who are opposed. Uh, and, and that predated my arrival in the governor's office last January. This has been going on for, for several years now. So, you know, there's some people for it and some against it. It seems to me the fairest way and the American way to resolve uh, that is uh, through an election. And so uh, that's what I've uh, authorized is uh, for an election to be conducted. And, and then the, the providers themselves should decide whether or not, and even if it were to be approved by a majority vote, no one would be forced to join the union. No one would be forced to pay dues into the union who uh, chooses not to be a member. So I, you know, it's it's really at this point, in my view, one that the the providers themselves uh, should be deciding, and not have you deny an election, you impose that view on uh, on the providers, and I think that's a mistake. And I was asked by some to mandate a union, and that would impose my uh, that view on the uh, on the providers. I think that's a mistake. You know, having a, an election where they decide is to me is the fairest way to approach it. Okay, I want to move on to another issue from this week. Senate Health and Human Services Committee took up the issue of reviewing the $25 million in federal grants that that review that was requested essentially halted the process of getting the grant dollars to the state. So the consensus coming out of that hearing, they want to make changes to the grant process and clear up miscommunications. And nothing in the things that we've contemplated in law would say that this grant would not be accepted. It's a question of when it would be accepted. Uh, and we're talking right now about what it does, and as I'm hearing this discussion, uh, my sense is that this is not about making sure people get screened, because they are going to be screened, regardless of whether this grant is. It's about improving an existing system of data gathering for assessment, which is maybe perfectly fine and legitimate. I'm asking you about the characterization of my actions and the description of them by the governor, whether they are accurate. And I'm assuming 
that you had discussions with the governor about this before he wrote the letter. And, and the reason I'm asking that is because when you and I talked about this, this didn't come up in our conversation. You never told me that if I did not let that grant go through, that 5,000 children would be severely harmed <coughs> by that, by following this process. And I just want to make sure that I understand whether I was being told accurately by you at that time that these grants and the, and the questioning of them would not cause harm, which is what you did tell me, or if the governor's right and they will cause harm. And I'm asking you directly, is this characterization of our action accurate by the governor? Senator Hand, when, when we met in your office and we went through these grants, um, we said that across the board that, that the lack of funding of these grants, the lack of implementation of these grants would affect uh, individuals in this state. I'm not asking then, whether they would affect individuals. We can stipulate that anything we do in state government will affect individuals. Right. The governor is saying that my actions will, not maybe, not possibly, will, they will severely harm 5,000 children. I'm just asking you to validate that statement, yes or no. Senator Hand, in, in our conversation, we did start going through the various grants. And we went through two grants, one related to primary care providers and one related to immunizations where we gave you the details. At that point, you said we would not talk about any more grants, so we were not able to go in your office, go through each of these grants uh, because of a meeting that you had to go to. So we were only able to go through two of the grants. Those are the two that you agreed that, that could mo move forward. We did not discuss any of these other ones in detail in your office. So when I asked you the question whether anybody would be harmed by the acceptance of these grants and you told me no, is that accurate or not? Senator Hanna, I, I don't believe <clears throat> that I said that no one would be harmed by the, <clears throat> by the not having these grants. In fact, uh, Mr. I, Chair, I was also in attendance at the meeting. I seem to recall that question by you, and Dr. Ellinger said that there would be repercussions to that, and we began to talk about the grants in more detail. And as Dr. Ellinger said, we only got through two of them and weren't able to discuss this grant. Well, and Commissioner, with all respect, that is not my recollection of the meeting because I asked you that as a general question and you gave me two grants that we subsequently agreed to release because you felt they met that criteria and we didn't debate that with you. We said fine. But you did not mention this grant at all in the course of that discussion and I don't believe that I was in a hurry to get out of that meeting. So, Governor, what's next in your opinion in moving along in this process of getting securing these grants and perhaps clearing up some of the miscommunications. I, I don't know what their problem is with the current procedures. I mean, you know, I'm not aware of this happening to Governor Plenty. And, you know, I, I just, you know, people that have their, their political differences with, you know, the, the federal government and the administration that's been elected by the people of this country but you know the, the, the lawful use of funds and Minnesota applies and gets a, one of four competitive grants among all the states, we should be applauding the fact that we're recognized to have that quality of, of health care service. And you know those who want to you know reverse some of the direction of federal health care policy should you know devote themselves to electing uh, you know somebody else president next year. That's certainly their right to do. But in the meantime. You know, this is the law of the country, and the federal government has a clearly established role, and we have a cl clearly established right to apply for grants. And I don't, I think, it'd be fundamentally wrong for the legislature to be telling the executive branch what they can and can't apply for. Have you had that conversation? Senator Han was the person who spearheaded this effort. Have, th have there been any conversations since he initially asked for the review? No, I have not had a conversation with him. No. Okay, I do want to move on to. A few other things. This is just one example of the differences in stark the stark differences in philosophy between some members of the legislature and the executive branch. Now, how confident are you that you can continue working with the GOP leaders to find solutions to Minnesota's problems? Looking ahead to next session. Well, we were, we've worked well in, in areas in the past. The streamlining of the environmental review process, so something we worked collaboratively. I think the uh, K-12 education bill had a lot of collaboration and uh, you know I've acknowledged uh, for example uh, Senator Jen Olson and uh, you know just a terrific uh, you know view of having every child be able to read by at or above grade level by the end of third grade and some of the other ways which we found to collaborate together and, and even Senator Han and 
uh, Commissioner uh, Cindy Jessen of Human Services co collaborated amazingly well at the very end of the negotiations to come up with a resolution that would uh, allow us to end the shutdown. So, you know, we're, we're all grown-ups and uh, we've all been involved to some extent uh, in the political process. And I've been doing it a long time. I find, you know, I agree with somebody today and disagree tomorrow and then agree the next day. And so, you know, I mean, I, I can work with anybody who can work with me and I don't hold grudges and I accept that this is part of the process that, you know, clashing of ideas and ideologies and points of view and that's democracy. Yeah, and you've touched on it a bit. How do you see your role as the leader of the state in fostering these relationships? Well, I've made a considerable effort last session, invited all the legislators and their spouses or significant others to the residents. I had uh, first uh, bi-weekly and then became weekly meetings with the leadership of both the Republicans and the DFLers, uh, separate meetings at their request. I met with them on a continuous basis. Uh, you know, went pheasant hunting with uh, Speaker Zellers, you know, I mean, you know, I mean, personal relationships, I, I like and respect, uh, you know, the people I've encountered in the legislature, they're really good people. We're going to clash when we have different views of what's best for Minnesota. and. You know, in the small d democratic process is that clash of ideas and and ideologies and points of view that uh, you know generally produce the the, the best result and, and you know sometimes uh, that you know discord is the is the noise of democracy at work one legislative session under your belt you're moving into the next one shortly what did you learn from the first one that you're going to take in with you next year well, the, that there are limits to the, what uh, personal relationships can <clears throat> can accomplish uh, uh, when the crunch comes at the end. Uh, that you know the majority in the House and the Senate are people with you know very uh, defined ideology, and they believe that they were elected in 2010 with uh, a mandate to carry that out, and that's a different mandate from when I would, was elected in 2010 to carry out, and that's you know that that was the decision made by the majority of the people of Minnesota. So, you know, that's the given we have, but, you know, we, we are going to be you know, continuing to disagree on, on important matters. And you know, that's, that's one of the results of divided government. If you were to summarize your time in office thus far, how would you do that? Um, I'm just so honored and delighted and thrilled to be here and mindful of how fortunate I am and you know, mindful of what the difference it makes to a lot of people who look at the world the way I do. And um, just mindful of how, you know, important it is that we, in my administration, do our utmost to show people that government can be better, we can serve people better, we can serve people more cost effectively. I'm really excited about the government reforms, the streamlining that we we're doing in all different agencies. And I think we'll have, you know, increasingly real results to show People, I mean, Commissioner Justin saves uh, taxpayers of both the state and federal of close to half a billion dollars in uh, competitive bidding the uh, health care uh, contracts uh, the state puts out. So, you know, there are really c concrete results already and we'll keep doing better. So real quickly, my last question, in your opinion, are Minnesotans better off now than they were when you took office? Well, we're going through a really hard economic time. I don't, uh, I mean, I... Statistically, you know, uh, total wages are up 4.8 percent this uh, year in Minnesota. But, you know, so many people are with over 200,000 people unemployed and people underemployed and people struggling. Uh, I, I don't, you know, I, we're not anywhere near where we need to be as a state or as a nation yet. Okay. On those words, Governor Mark Dayton, thank you so much for joining us thank today. You. We really thank appreciate you. your time. Thank you. Discussions move forward on a Viking stadium. On Thursday, the governor met with members of the Ramsey County Commission and laid out the foundation to acquire the Arden Hills site. We talked about the, uh, the purchase agreement with the GSA regarding the Arden Hills sites, and uh, we talked about uh, uh, particulars about the agreements we've had with the Vikings and, uh, you know, how do we get to move this forward and uh, hopefully to have a special session uh, and get the job done for the state of Minnesota. It was a very productive meeting. We discussed uh, a lot of the more minor details that become important details later on. And I think the governor has a better understanding of where we're coming from, and we have a much better understanding of where he's coming from. Now if we can just get the legislature to do the same.
With just two months to go before session, the Senate Judiciary and Public Safety Committee met to take up several agenda items, including one that would get the legislature active in judicial elections. So the question becomes, you know, why do we care? I mean, uh, I think it's fair to say that we have a, a, a real good uh, judicial branch in terms of the quality of our judges in the state of Minnesota, and I think that's a fair statement. There are exceptions to that, but on the whole, our judges are good judges. So why do we care whether or not we are going to uh, uh, rock the boat, so to speak? And I'm going to go right back to the Constitution. The Constitution is the law in the state of Minnesota that trumps everything. It trumps regulations, it trumps rules, it trumps, it trumps the statutes that we pass. It is the bedrock of our democracy and we have to follow it. And I think we have to follow our Constitution whether we agree with the terms of it or not. And if we do not agree with the terms of our Constitution, then there is a provision to amend it. And we, in my estimation, are clearly not following our Constitution when it comes to the uh, selection process of judges. And I believe that to be an extraordinarily dangerous precedent. What I want you to do as legislators is come back to my original position. We've had some discussion on the merits of whether uh, the, the current election system is good or bad, and no matter how long we debate it, uh, there are going to be folks on both sides. I simply want you to go to the Constitution and look at it and become involved in judicial elections like the Constitution directs us to do. Do not abdicate your responsibility to the Supreme Court. Become involved in judicial elections. Uh, that's why I brought these bills forward, because I want you to look at these issues. And to me, this is more of an academic issue. I'm not attacking any judges. I'm simply saying the Constitution is not being followed, and I am asking you to look into it and to enact appropriate legislation so that we abide by the terms of the Constitution. That wraps up this week's program. From all of us at Senate Media Services, I'm Julie Barkey. Thank you for watching Capitol Report.